And I will, so here we are, Befriend a Family Team equipping session. And I am going to uh, turn it over to Megan. Thanks. So yeah, we can just get right into it. There's a lot of content tonight. Um, but I also wanna mention that as you're absorbing the content tonight, um, we are working on a resource guide for volunteers that will be available in the next few days. Um, so feel free to take notes and, and absorb it however you want, but don't worry if you miss something because there will be it all nicely typed up and um, with graphics and everything and a guide that will be digital and available in a few days. So, so don't stress too much if you miss something. Um, and then throughout, if anyone has any questions or comments, or especially things that they have found as they're working with families um, that, you know, you uh, have found is really helpful or kind of like a, a tip or a hack, we also want to include those in the guide as well. And just sharing with one another because we learn so much from one another. So feel free to interrupt us at any time and just jump in. So let me advance down here. So um, some of this you might be familiar with and some of this might be brand new for others. So that's okay, wherever you're at, um, just hang in there if this is like old news for you. But there are three basic benefit cards that um, refugees work with. So you guys have probably heard SNAP, WIC, MassHealth um, thrown around a lot. So we're just gonna go through those three cards first and, um, and just go a little bit more in depth on how to use those and some of the troubleshooting uh, things that are happening. So the first is EBT or SNAP. So it used to be called EBT, now it's kind of called SNAP, but they're kind of interchangeable still. So these, this card, um, it looks like this on the screen and it can only be used for non-prepared foods. So it's assistance from the government um, for refugees <clears throat> excuse me, and other people who need help with food um, assistance, but they can um, get those things um, if they can't afford it on their own. So each month funds are added on the same day of the month, each month, and it may seem randomized what, who gets benefits when, but it actually depends on the last digit of your social security number. So say your social security number ends in a six, then you would get it on the corresponding day of that month, the 10th. So there's a chart that is um, on their website and also in the guide so you can look and see that way you can help people know when to expect that their funds would be there. But it should be every, it, every month. It's replenished on the same day at midnight. Um, and it does have a PIN number for security. So kind of like a debit card. Um, and again, it's SNAP or EBT. But you can't buy everything with SNAP. So you can't buy alcoholic beverages, cigarettes, vitamins, medicines, um, any food that will be eaten in the store, so like <clears throat> even rotisserie chickens you can't buy, any hot food um, or non-edible items like laundry supplies, you know, paper products, pet food, all of that, just human non-prepared foods. Um, another thing that is linked with the, uh, mat the DTA and the same EBT card is something called transitional assistance to families with dependent children. Um, and there's the acronym TAFDC, if you don't want to say that whole thing every time, because it is a mouthful. Um, but it, this is also reloaded automatically on the same day of the month, each month. And so Jen will talk a little bit more later about how these are determined, like who gets um, TAFDC and who doesn't. But this is only for um, people with dependent children. It's not for singles or for couples without children. And so um, if you get recommended for English help also with this, because you have kind of a, a in, it's, yeah, so it's income based and the employment is tracked through an employment counselor. And so if that employment counselor also uh, recommends you for English help, um, then the parents need to prove that they are taking time to learn English. So, you know, they'll check in and they kind of have to prove, oh yeah, we went to class three times last week or, or so. So this is good to know if uh, one of the families you're working with has TAF-DC, that they'll need to really be thinking about how to maintain that status. And one of the things is being in regular English classes. So this also has a, a PIN number for security. Um, and this can be used for non-food items like um, 
you know, soap, hygiene items, things like that, but it can also be used for food as well. So does anyone have any questions about those two things before I go on to the next thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just got a question. Um, just to be clear, are all Afghan refugees automatically, are they automatically eligible for these? For both the SNAP and the TAF DC? Yeah. Well, I know TAF DC is for families, but. Right, right. Yeah. So only families would be for that. Yes, they are eligible. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, all of them are eligible. And that's really because they don't have a job. Um, and the job is being, you know, starting work is being delayed. So there is um, nothing else that can be offered at this point. Um, and there, there is, we're going to um, talk about um, another benefit for those that are single or just married couples without dependent children. For the English classes, Megan, mm -hmm. can they count our English um tutoring on Fridays or does it have to be an official program that's tracked? Yeah, I think that it does need to be an official program. Um, and the employment counselor will kind of help them know what is an official program and what is not an official program. But there are definitely some that they recommend, like Accentria is a very popular one that meets three times a week. Click on your box, would you hand? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, Heather, did you have something? Uh oh, we can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Oh, mm -hmm. yes, we can. Thank Along you. those lines, are there, um, you said there's employment counselors that track the English learning. Um, are they told if they're at risk of losing their benefits because they're not learning English? So I, maybe Jen, you would know this answer, but how I understand it is there are regular check-ins. And so I think at that check-in there would be, and also when they're signed up for it, they kind of run through, you know, this is what you need for this. But I think there are check-ins. I don't know if you know something I, more, Jen. I was with a woman once um, who her assistance amount had been less that week or that month than she expected. And it was because she was taking the classes at Accentria, but Accentria hadn't sent in her attendance for that week. So yeah. what I understood from that was that Accentria was taking attendance and sending it in to wherever they have to, to um, prove that she had been in English classes that week or that month um, so that she would get the appropriate amount, amount of money. So it was less because they hadn't, th they thought she was not in class because they hadn't somehow it got missed and it had to be made up. Right. So these don't have to be in-person classes for English. They can be online, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is some form that I used, um, Lachman and Karaman used to get and like check boxes on which days they went to class and such. And, mm -hmm. and Linda, it doesn't count for students. It's only the parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just... Megan, is the TAFDC an amount on top of the DTA amount in um, addition to? You, do you mean the SNAP benefits or, or cash assistance? The cash assistance is in addition to the SNAP benefits. I think it is. Do you know, Jen? Yeah, so the SNAP is just for food and the right. TAFTC is for cash. So it's a different amount. Yeah, so okay. yeah, they're different. So Right, and then the cash benefits are also a separate thing that we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's because there are two there are two programs that give cash for refugees. So we're mm -hmm. just talking about one of them right now that is administrated through DTA, which is the Department of Transitional Assistance, and that's uh, just for families with the dependent children. And then we'll we'll get to the other cash benefit next. Okay. Anybody? Sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> I, no, I put it up and I put it down. I put it back up. Um, how do we know if they have um, TAFDC? Like I've gone shopping with people and it says, you know, when they put their card in, it says EBT or cash. Is that? Oh, yes. I'll show you how. There's the whole slide. Okay. I, I did screenshots. So uh, yeah, I'll show you how you can I'm check. Just like, yeah, I'm just thinking about all the different people. <laughs> oh, I know. It's so hard to know. It's so hard to tell. 
yeah, I'll definitely point that out. Okay, anything else with um, TAFT? Linda? Linda? Um, when I was at NCC, I know that um, the principal had to fill out forms at some point telling that, showing that the kids had been in school. So what was that for then? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Truancy report? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. that's something to do with their benefits. I know that. Huh. That would be news to me. So why don't we, we'll put that down as a question. Okay. Uh, you know, if, yeah. is there something that is related to the children's requirement in order to have TAFDC? Because they, you know, I mean, children have to go to school for, because mm -hmm. it's just mandatory um, to be educated. So, um, so I, I don't know about that. We can check. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to go to the next one. We have a lot of stuff to get through. <laughs> I'm nervous. Okay. So um, if you haven't used a SNAP or cash assistance card, that blue card, um, this is how you do it at the store. So like Heather was saying, you slide the card and it will say, do you want to use food or cash? So if you're using the SNAP benefits, you just hit food and it will take off the amount. And then whatever is left, you can use your cash benefits or pay in a different way. You can use both at the same time. You'll, you'll have to swipe your card twice, but you can use food and cash in the same order. Um, and so you don't have to do separate or you don't have to separate it out at all. So then you just uh, enter your pin and then the transaction is complete. So if for some reason you put your, you know, you swipe your card, you put your pin, you select food, you put your pin in and it bounces, it probably means that you don't have enough for the entire order on your card. So what you'll need to do is just log into the DTA app, which I have screenshots of too, I'll show you, and check how much is there. So say you only have $150 on it, you you would tell the cashier, oh, I need to just do $150 on my food stamp card. They'll put it in and it will go through after. So sometimes it says, you know, cannot process or something like that. And that just means that you might need to put in only a certain amount because it's saying, oh, I can't pay for this whole, whole food order um, sort of thing. So um, some other troubleshooting things for TAF, uh, for SNAP and TAF DC are knowing when benefits expire. So they do carry over um, from month to month, but if you don't use them in 90 days, they will expire. Wow. And then with SNAP, if you don't use them for six months or more, they're taken off your card until you contact DTA. But if you don't get them back within a year, they're just gone. So this will be very rare that this ever happens, that mm -hmm. somebody doesn't use their card or money. But I just wanted to mention it just in case that's something, you know, that you ever run into, they can get it back, but it needs to be sooner rather than later. So um, in this just talks about, you know, if you request to restore expired cash benefits, um, you can get them back if you request a restoration within six months of the date. Um, but six months after the expiration date, they will be permanently unavailable and can't be restored. Um, and so you can put in for a, like you could make a case for it, but again, this is going to be really rare that you ever run into this. You're probably going to run into the opposite problem where they're like, it's gone. Um, so, and then this is just a little bit of information about how to restore expired SNAP benefits as well. So, um, there's a number here that you can call. And again, this is in the, um, the guide as well. So, but uh, this is really rare that you'll ever run into this. I just wanted to mention it to kind of give a bigger view of, of what's going on. So a couple other troubleshooting things. Um, so to use your EBT card, you must enter your four number secret pin into the machine, just like debit card or, or something like that. So your, the pin will arrive in the mail separately from your card and it could take five to 10 business days to arrive. Um, but I know that there is a way um, to change it. So there is a way to change it online that I'm still investigating um, to put in the guide, but there's also this number here that you can call 
if you don't want to go to the DTA office. I would recommend just calling this number after the pin comes in and having them put it to something they'll remember. Um, that, or if they're fine, just remembering their pin too. That's nice and easy. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go through this extra step unless they really want to change it. Um, but while you're waiting for an EBT card, you can use the EBT card number to shop for groceries online. And I know that you can do online pickup orders, Price Shopper, Wegmans, um, even Amazon. Um, there's a bunch of different stores, BJ's, that you can do pickup orders for. And if you're really in a crunch, I know that you can ask the cashier to enter in your EBT card number because I did that a lot when I worked at Price Chopper. So if you are really, really in a pickle, you can ask the cashier, I have my number, can you just enter it in? I don't have the actual card. And they might ask you for an ID. They actually will ask you for some ID, but it can be done, so. Um, their EBT customer service is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is amazing. Mm. You can call it 3 a.m. if you want. I hope you don't have to, I hope you never do that, but you could. Mm. Um, so you can call them if your card is lost, stolen, damaged, if you wanted to change your PIN, uh, if you wanted to find out how much you have left in account, if you feel like you got charged for something you didn't buy, or if you have any other questions or problems and it is free, it won't be charged uh, on any phone plan. So here is this helpful little slide that hopefully helps us look at this. So this is um, what the DTA app, can you guys see this little uh, circle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow, so oh, cool. I didn't <laughs> know you could see that. Okay, so here's the DTA <laughs> app. This is what it looks like on your phone. And then once you click on that, this is what it looks like um, in like on your phone. So you enter in the social security number and the year of birth. So then once you hit log in, brings you to the next screen, then it will show you what your SNAP benefits are. So right now it's $0 effective as of this date. The next SNAP, be SNAP benefit will be on this date and it will tell you how much you're gonna get. And if you have the TAF DC and other cash benefit other, or other cash benefits for the DTA, they'll show up under here. Okay. So this screenshot doesn't have the cash benefits. It just has SNAP benefits and it will show up under here. So you'll be able to do, uh, see everything you need to on here, which is really nice. The other things you can do with the app is down here where it says upload. If the DTA needs any documents, say they need an address verification or an income verification, you can take a picture and upload it right from the app. So that is really nice. And it will also keep track of documents that you have mm -hmm. and um, your info. And then this is just like log out, whatever. So, um, so that's really nice. The app is really user-friendly and it, this is gonna be a lifesaver as people say, I don't know how much food stamps I have. I don't know when I'm getting my next food stamp. You can just see right here and right here when you'll get the next one and then cash benefits as well. So that's super nice. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a DTA office. It is very hidden. It's so hard to find. Um, so I wanted to make a little slide so you can see what it looks like. It's in the former Big Y parking lot, like where Chuck E. Cheese is on Southwest Cutoff. It's in that plaza, but it is so hard to find because they need a way bigger sign than this. So if you go to this address and you'd say, Megan sent me to this weird parking lot. I promise I didn't, it's actually there. You just have to look really hard. It's like right near CVS. So don't give up. It is there. <laughs> and then one other thing to mention about these cards is a program called Car Card to Culture. And this is awesome for befriend a family teams. So basically it, it is part of a, a governmental program to help people experience more of the culture and art in the New England area well, at least for the, the mass DTA, just in Massachusetts. So um, residents who receive the DTA benefits can get discounted admissions by showing their EBT card. And they are wild like this. So you can get into the New England or the Boston Aquarium for $4 a person. And I mean, you can get into zoos for free and you know, all of these places for super, super discounted. And every refugee family has 
many DTA cards. And so this is such a cool opportunity for you to be able to go and experience things with them and go on field trips and have fun without paying hundreds of dollars and them worrying about paying. And, and so all you have to do is just show your EBT card, or even I've just even done it over the phone. Sometimes they don't even ask for it. And um, you say, oh, I need the EBT discounted price. And it's super easy. A lot of people do it. So I would definitely look into this um, if you're thinking about doing, you know, field trips or even just going to Boston and having fun, going to a museum, you can get in for free. So highly, highly would recommend this. And on the um, guide, I linked um, the page. It breaks it up into like Metro, Central, North, so of different parts of Massachusetts. So you can look by your area as well and see where you want to be. So uh, I linked that in the guide and, and so you can check out like where, where you might want to go. The Ecotarium I think is free in Worcester mm -hmm. or at least $2 a person. So, okay. So this is the other cash assistance. Maybe this is what you were talking about earlier, Julie, the RCA. So this is um, what is offered for couples or singles without children. And so it comes from the state office of ORI, which is the Office of Refugee and Immigrants. And the amount given and the amount of time that they receive these benefits is based on income as reported by a employment counselor. So they can be on it for up to eight months. So it's not forever. It's just up to eight months is the maximum amount of time. And they're given a check from the resettlement agency for 428 per month. Um, so this is, again, just for couples and singles without children. And then the TAF DC is for families with children. Um, so does anybody have any questions about this before? I, I just on? want to point out too that that's $428 per person. So if it's a couple, that's doubled. Um, if it's adult children in a family that has dependent children, the adult children, anyone who is not a dependent, uh, not a minor, will get the RCA cash. Um, so there are many families that have small children and then um, some older children. So they all get cash benefit, um, but it's through different programs. Mm -hmm. One other thing I wanted to point out, um, uh, sometimes if there is an issue, someone says, oh, I didn't get my, uh, they, I didn't get my EBT, I didn't get my cash assistance, what's the, why is that, why was it denied, um, and I, I think this might be in the resource manual, but uh, Megan, could you go back to the, um, to the app pictures? Mm-hmm. So the far right picture there, um, if someone has TA FTC cash benefits, they would scroll all the way down. And when they do, it will say a case manager for their DTA benefits, the person's name and a phone number. So that is terrific. Now that's only if they have cash benefits because they have to have an assigned caseworker that's going to be um, managing and overseeing their, um, their benefits. Um, if someone has just SNAP benefits, um, they won't have a caseworker assigned, but there is a main number. If anyone has any issues, there is a main number and you can um, call that. That will be in the resource manual as well. But there are some um, really helpful ways that we're learning that how we can troubleshoot with one of our Afghan friends or whomever. That was all I wanted to say. Yeah, that's really good to know. Yeah, and per person too. Mm -hmm. Won't so if they play, <laughs> right, if they play their cards right, they can really get a lot of assistance and you know be in a good place, not in scarcity. Um, okay, so WIC which stands for Women, Infants, and Children. So WIC is a nutrition program to provide healthy foods, nutrition education, breastfeeding support, and referrals to healthcare and other services free of charge to Massachusetts families who qualify, uh, but only if they have children under the age of five. So five and older, WIC um, isn't an option for them. And this here is what the card looks like. 
And so there is a WIC nutritionalist that will actually meet with the expected mom or the, um, you know, the baby is already born or the young kids um, that will help you select your food package every one to three months. So there's different packages you can choose, which is actually really nice depending on your family's preferences. Um, and each month your family's WIC food benefits will be deposited onto your card, similar to SNAP or the other cash assistance things that we were talking about earlier. So um, there is eligible food and non-eligible food, and I'll show you on a different slide what that is. Um, and similar to SNAP, you don't have to use all of the benefits at one time. You just have to use them um, before uh, the, the next cycle so, kind of thing. So you have a certain amount of time to buy a certain amount of food. Um, so there's no need to feel like, oh, I have to get all the food right now and use the WIC card in one go. So um, WIC participants can also receive discounts on heating bills, internet connection, and tickets to over 100 museums and cultural organizations, which is amazing. I actually just learned this today. So, um, so this is really, really something to look into for um, young moms um, or you know, expectant mothers as well. And so, because it is also pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women, infants, and children. So it, it really takes care of the woman as well um, before the baby is born and then afterwards as well. So um, in order to apply, you just have to uh, submit some documents about income eligibility and state residency. So um, all of those things are expounded upon in the guide too. And you also have to be individually determined to be a nutrition risk by a health professional or a trained health official. So a lot of the time your doctor might work with, um, with your WIC, you know, just to determine, okay, you are breastfeeding, you're not getting enough. So we're gonna help you out and get this going for you. Um, so this is um, the sign you, you wanna look for in grocery stores, because there are only certain things that are WIC approved. So it's not like SNAP where you could, if you really wanted to, you could just buy a hundred packs of Oreos, but with WIC, it's really targeted nutrition. And so there are certain things on the list that you can buy and then everything else you cannot get. So it's like vegetables, fruits, milk, eggs, beans, peanut butter, you know, the list is here and, and on the um, guide as well but you really wanna look for this symbol. And here's um, something that I learned when I was doing a lot of WIC when I worked at the grocery store, you wanna match the UPCs because it is so frustrating to get to the checkout line and realize that the eggs that were WIC, like they could be two dozen eggs, but some brands are participants, some brands are not participants. So you wanna really make sure you even have the right brand and the exact right amount of it. Because if it's a 15.5 ounce box of cereal, it's not gonna work because it's only 15 ounces of cereal. So just watch out for that because there's been a lot of frustrating situations wow. like that. Heather, did you have something? Um, maybe you're gonna cover this, but there is a WIC app and there's a, a, a UPC key scan, a scanner. Yes. On the app. Are you gonna cover that already? Yeah, but that's okay. That's you just all right. Scan, as you're shopping, you scan everything. Yeah, that's super nice. I don't feel like they had that. <laughs> they have it now. Yeah. Yeah, that was really nice because there were some precarious situations. Anybody, does anybody else have anything? I'm sorry, I can't see your hands very well, so I'm just scrolling through. Wick is super complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, you just have to be really. I think that you have to go into it knowing that it's just gonna take a little bit extra time and a little bit extra patience. But thankfully, as soon as you, the first time you use WIC is always the most challenging. And then after that, you know, okay, this brand is good. I know exactly which eggs to get. Okay, this gallon of milk, I know exactly where it is. I'm gonna get it, but you're totally right. The first time you just have to drink a little extra coffee that morning. Just go do it knowing that it might be a little bit of a day. It's it's overwhelming for some of the people who, you know, aren't literate, you know, in their own language, let alone English. It's there's so many details and so you have to and, and if they're already exhausted and tired and they're dragging around a bunch of kids in the store, it's some of my people have said they just don't care. They're just not even using it because it's too much it's too complicated for them to handle. 
when their lives are so complicated anyway. Yeah, it's, definitely. It's really sad. I've gone, I've like said, just give me your card. I'm going to the store. I'm going to grab some things for you, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, this is a great way that you can encourage and empower people because I can't imagine doing this if I did not speak English. I can barely do it when I do speak English. So as you help people learn how to use the resources that are available to them, it's so encouraging for them. And and by the way, I just want to say the time I grabbed the card and did it for them, it was because the man had, had worked all day, been at the hospital all, I mean, worked all night been at the hospital with his child all day and worked all night again and mm. was in no frame of mind to go shopping. So and they had no <laughs> in the house. Are you, you're defending yourself that you weren't enabling, right? Right, right. Exactly. I, I do not I do not say it's a good thing to grab their wit card and go do it for them. Don't <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so just a few troubleshooting things. Um, I'll go through these really quick. If you do enter the wrong pin, don't try to guess it. Um, after several incorrect attempts, it will be blocked and then it's you can't use it after that. You have to go through and call and get it unlocked and everything. So, um, but if you do want to unlock, there are some ways down there. Um, or you can just wait till midnight and your account will automatically unlock which is very strange to me, but if you don't yeah. want to call, you can just wait till the next day. Mm-hmm. So um, if you forget your pin, you have to go to a WIC office. You can't, um, they won't tell you it over the phone. Um, Plus they need the- to go, they have to have kind of regular appointments with WIC. I don't remember what right. time frame, Usually but- there are- Oh, sorry, Samantha. Yeah. yeah, no, it's like, yeah, I don't know what time frame, but- Yes, it's every one to three months, I believe. And the um, caseworker will do house calls sometimes. So yeah. you can select if you need a house call, they'll come to your house, which is really nice. You don't have to. Yeah, I think they had to weigh the babies and. Um... Yeah, it's a lot more medical than just snap. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's very medical you... because you actually need a doctor's referral. Right. So not everyone who has a baby will probably will qualify. The vast majority will just because of their income bracket, but it doesn't mean just because you have a baby, you have WIC. No, but um, I think if they're going to family health care or, or Edward, Edward Kennedy, they're right. Right. They're, no, I'm saying yeah. a lot of, a lot of the refugees will do qualify, but yeah. just for like general knowledge, if you have a baby, it's not everyone. Um, so, and if you don't purchase the foods, uh, within the next month, they won't, you won't be able to just compound them. Uh, they will expire, which is good to know. So, all right. So now I'm going to pass it on to Jen and she's going to talk about the third card. So in Massachusetts, Medicaid and the children's health insurance program are combined into one program called mass health. And MassHealth members may be able to get doctor visits, prescription drugs, hospital stays, many other important services for a discounted price or for free. So uh, there are, um, everyone who comes in as a refugee is eligible for MassHealth. There have been some delays along with lots of other things with people getting their physical MassHealth card or being registered with one of the health centers. In Worcester, there are two. There's the Family Health Center of Worcester, which is um, more on the south part of Worcester off Chandler Street. And then there's the Edward M. Kennedy Health Center, which is over uh, by Lincoln Street, more on the northern end of the city. And so if anyone basically doesn't have a Mass Health card, really the, the thing that needs to be done is just to contact their caseworker. There is, there's no way for us to find out where things are in the process. Uh, we do know that um, I, I'm on some calls with uh, the city agencies related to health issues. And so this has been a big conversation, how to get people expedited to get enrolled in mass health. And so there, it, 
it starts with the resettlement agency. They have to put in a referral to the health center, and then they can start the process of um, getting mass health. The referral has to have some official documents. Um, and so um, there has been a backlog. Uh, for the most part, people have gotten their mass health at this point. They may not have their actual card, but, um, but things are improving there. So there is the, um, the mass health office right in Worcester. Um, I'm not sure if they do walk-ins or not, uh, but there's some phone numbers and sometimes you have to wait five hours, but hey, that's, that's the way life goes. <laughs> no, I, they are getting better with their wait times. So let's move on. Uh, so one of the things being on these um, medical um, calls for Afghan refugees is that there were many people that have not been to the doctor yet. They're not sure about their medical benefits and they're panicked because they don't know what to do if they need to see a doctor. And so initially, when there were a lot of refugees coming in, Afghans coming in December, um, there were 195 that came in that month. So it was really overwhelming. Uh, so many people were going to the emergency room for a rash or a sore throat. They were doing the full-fledged emergency room, uh, but they had no other information at that point. They didn't know what to do. And so as things have calmed down and people have been educated about um, who their doctor is, who to call, that sort of thing, they decided that they would make an identification card that anyone can fill out. Um, and right now the resettlement agency is, is um, going to be doing that. So it is just a way, uh, it's useful for many things. It will be available in their languages, uh, but it has their basic, identifying information that anyone would need to know because many do not speak any English. And so, you know, what's your date of birth? What's your address? What's your, you know, they aren't able to always get that information right up front before the translator um, comes. Um, so this is all um, going to be written out in English as well as their native language. And it also comes with instructions of what to do, who to call if you have an urgent medical uh, situation versus a, an emergency. Um, and um, so that's, this is a project that's kind of under construction. The other thing that this is really good for is when the health center might call a cab and, to come and pick you up for uh, an important doctor's appointment. This has happened, happened to me. I was picking up someone and um, I had a feeling that maybe the yellow cab that was waiting there might have been called for the same person uh, because there was a lot of miscommunication. So anyway, I said, I said, would you happen to be waiting for whatever the name was? And he looked at the piece of paper he had and he said, no, I'm not waiting for that person. Um, and so we went on our merry way and lo and behold, that taxi was waiting for the same person that I was bringing to the health center. <laughs> so, um, so this is very useful so that when a taxi is called, they know, you know, this is, uh, because they have many names, they go by many names mm -hmm. and I just had chosen the wrong one to, to mention to them. Um, but this is also just going to be a helpful communicator for um, for when someone needs an Uber or a taxi to an appointment. Jen, what's the HB number? So what's the HB for? number is, um, it actually, actually stands for Honeybee. It's their Honeybee number. And basically it's from the database on the military bases that's called Honeybee. And oh. when people, humanitarian, they came as humanitarian parolees, there was no way of identifying them. So they had them put into their database and it was the Honeybee database. So therefore they have an HB number. So it's their, it's their main identifier. Um, okay. until they get the social security number and, you know, driver's license until their, um, their uh, documentation could have uh, had the, 
until USCIS and the government had a chance to go through their documents. So this was just a quick way of giving them some sort of identifier. Mm, okay. So everyone, every refugee gets um, medical benefits through Mass Health, but the Office of Refugee and Immigrant pays for a very special refugee health assessment. And that's done through this refugee health assessment program. And um, it is, um, it's very extensive. They get lots of vaccinations. A lot of time is spent for these appointments. Um, when you have a, multiple family members come in, it's kind of an all day event. Um, so the doctors really need to uh, set aside quite a bit of time uh, to do these health assessments. Um, they uh, will do various testings. They'll, um, they'll then refer them to a primary care physician. But knowing how long these appointments are and the number of people that are waiting, these health assessments are not, are being scheduled out to May and June. Mm. So because of that, they are being referred to a primary care doctor. Um, even before their refugee health assessment is completed because they need to know I have just a sore throat. Who do I call? So again, that is where that identification card comes in very handy. And so they know uh, which health center to call and um, who to ask for. And they're using a lot of the urgent care at both of the health centers for some of these appointments uh, so that um, people can be seen quickly. There are also a lot of pregnant women. They are being taken as high priority to get their refugee health assessment done, to get them into um, um, an OB visit and uh, scheduled uh, with um, the, the hospital that they're gonna be going to. So I think right now, um, I just want to brag on Heather a little bit. So Heather is um, actually going to be signing up for a doula class because she has helped uh, bring into the world three Afghan babies. And, um, so she's basically on call all the time now. Um, so she has a, a new lease, a new calling. Um, so that's just really, really been exciting to see um, how God is using that in her life. So next, uh, so I mentioned about transportation with uh, taxis. There is a uh, some funding that has come through the Worcester Together Afghan Response Fund. Um, it's in partnership with United Way, and they have uh, given some money um, into an account with the Yellow Cab Taxi Service. Uh, because everyone was overwhelmed with the number of medical appointments that people needed. So, uh, so they were uh, very generous in doing this. Um, at this point, the funds are pretty limited, but it is only for medical appointments. And so it's not an excuse to teach someone how to take the bus, um, but it's just kind of a crisis mode, a crisis answer, um, to the overwhelming need for transportation for medical appointments. If anyone does need to access this, um, these appointments using the yellow, yellow taxi, um, there is now a pretty clear process. Uh, when I picked up that, that woman to bring her to an appointment, there wasn't a process. So uh, we had some text messaging going back and forth. Can you call the yellow cab? No, I can't. Can you call the yellow cab? Oh, well, I'm going to go pick her up. Well, I called the yellow cab. Well, no one told me that they called the yellow <laughs> cab. So it is now very streamlined. Anyone who would like a uh, yellow cab referral, it is being coordinated by Mona Ives of Ansar, which is an agency, uh, Muslim agency that we are really working closely with. And um, preferably that needs to be done ahead of time and everything is streamlined there. So the email will be in the resource guide as well. Uh, so no, please um, um, only use this service if all other options have been exhausted to get the family to the appointment because the funds are limited and it's not sustainable. So we really wanna teach people um, how they can get there on their own, um, you know, taking the bus, 
uh, coordinating with a friend, coordinating with one of their friend of family teams even, uh, but just to take ownership of that. So at this point, Megan is gonna talk about driving. <laughs> so um, maybe some of you have been asked by some of the refugees that you're working with, how do I get my permit? How do I get my license? How do I drive? And it's really frustrating for them because they drove in Afghanistan. A lot of them drove. I was just talking with a guy who drove professionally in Afghanistan and he said, I can't pass the permit test. Actually, you know him, Ryan. Um, he said, I can't pass the permit test because I can't use the computer. I don't know the words, but I'm an excellent driver. I promise, ma'am, I'm an excellent driver. <laughs> So he is desperate to, to learn that. So Ryan's been helping him out um, studying for the permit and stuff. So thank you so much, Ryan. But um, here's kind of the rundown of, of the permit. So it's $30 to take and um, you start the application online um, to make an appointment to visit a RMV to provide the required identification documentation. So this is where it gets a little weird. So you make the, the appointment online and then you um, have to go to the appointment and bring the application. Documents have been processed and verified at a service center. Then the refugee will be given login instructions and credentials to complete their test at home. So they're not doing in-person permit tests, just online permit tests. So you get, you make an appointment online, you bring the documents, you get it all verified, then you go back home <laughs> and take the permit test. So here are the documents that are necessary. Um, US citizenship or lawful presence. Um, so that works with current passport, uh, with a I-94, a I-94 form, or a work authorization card with a passport. Um, there are some different combinations that will work. Um, also their social security number and Massachusetts residency. Um, and so mail addressed from an official entity to them counts. So any bills or sometimes um, we, or lately we've been asking for um, address verification letters to be sent by the resettlement agency so that we can um, just get an official piece of mail that they can take with them to the RMV. And all the documents must be originals. So no photocopied passports or work authorization cards, don't laminate them. Um, and then, like a lot of other things, the document can't be used to prove more than one requirement. So a big barrier for a lot of people taking this permit test is the English. So it's not available. And actually, Ryan, did you ever find if it was available in Pashto or Dari? I don't know you're so in chat. What I found was this, this was based off of the handbook. I thought that it was available in... Farsi, which I think shows up as Persian yeah, on, on the booklet. Um, but I think that's the only, I don't think it's in Pashto or Urdu. Okay, um, yeah. So maybe Farsi or Persian. Yeah, but for anyone else who doesn't speak those, it's really challenging because it, I mean, the permit test itself is really technical. Like, it's not like, what's a stop sign? You know, that's very easy, but it's like, I remember on my permit test, it was like, if you drag race twice, how much do you have to pay on your fourth offense, you know? <laughs> and so it's really complicated questions that, you, that are just hard when you don't have the background, you don't have the context, you don't have language. So yeah. um, helping people to study for the permit test is really helpful um, so that they can pass that and then start practicing. So once they have passed that test and are ready to practice, um, then they can work towards getting their license. And the license fee is $35, similar to the permit, just $5 more. And you schedule the road test of the RMV online. And um, the appointments are really scarce. So you wanna make sure that you schedule in advance. They're less scarce than they were. It used hmm, to be yeah. very intense to get an appointment. And now um, through Bob, our driving coordinator, he's been able to get them easily and people are getting them easily. So. I don't know if they're as scarce as they used to be, but definitely plan in advance for this. And um, there is also no interpreter available. So the English must be good for instructions, you know, pull over to the right, uh-oh, you know, left, 
whatever. Um, so you want to make sure also, and you can prep them with these things too. You know, you can study words that are very specific to permit tests and license and, and things like that and really practice with them. You know, okay, how, what does it sound like when someone says, put your right hand out? Sounds like that. Okay, now I know how to do that. Because um, these are really sharp people. They're really smart people. They have experience driving. They just need the language for it. So, um, so again, these are the um, documents that you'll need for the license name, date of birth, social security number, learner's permit number, must be originals, can't be more than once. Standard. Um, I just want to make a quick note about the warm driving program. So we do offer driving instruction, but it's through you guys. So we don't have a huge professional team that's just ready to help um, people learn. It's all through volunteers. And so uh, we are in desperate need right now of first people to help refugees just practice, you know, American roads in in driving in the, in the states, but then also people who are willing to sponsor um, for a driving test. So all that means is you just need your license. You just got to show up. You got to sit in the back and, um, and, and just be a sponsor in that way. So a lot of people are ready to take their tests, but then they don't have a sponsor. So if you are interested in that, um, please email me or bob at warmwelcoming.org. And also if you know someone who wants driving help um, and you're not able to do that, you can always email Bob and they'll be put on the waiting list. I'm not gonna lie to you, the waiting list is getting very long. So be realistic if you say, oh yeah, warm does driving help, but let them know that it's very long right now. We don't have many driving instructors. And so uh, it would be great if any of you would like to be driving instructors. Um, one more thing, and then I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions or comments or anything. So if adults are enrolled in the CRES, the Comprehensive Refugee Employment Services, they're eligible for free driving instruction. Wow. So there is currently an arrangement with Richway Driving School to receive funding directly from ORI. So it's not um, any cost to the refugee or sponsor if they, if they do this. Who is the Comprehensive Refugee Employment Services? Good question, and we'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> I never heard of that one. Yeah, does anyone have any questions about driving or anything that they've found while helping some people? I just want to make a plug. We need women and in driving instructors specifically also. There's one, one other thing also is that there are times when the, um, the testing, the road tester will allow a translator to sit in the back seat. So sometimes they will, they will do that, um, but not always. So I know Bob has asked for prayer sometimes. Oh, please, you know, pray that they'll allow his brother to sit in the back seat to translate for him, that sort of thing. Is that what you have found too, Linda? Um, I've never had that. I've never had the need, well, or someone volunteering to translate. So I haven't had that. Um, I did want to say that, um, as Ryan was saying, there are um, the tests when they have them on the computer at the RMV are offered in several languages. Mm -hmm. The ones that you can get now uh, and the online ones, uh, at least the ones that I've seen my boys taking are only Spanish or English. Oh, wow. And do they have to pay each time for the learner's permit, but only once for the license? Is that true? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I but they that. have to pay each time for a road test. Oh, it's fail, road they have to pay for both. Okay. What about, are they getting real IDs? You know, we're all supposed to have the real ID by next year. When they get their driver's license, is it a real ID? Most of them aren't. And I, what I've heard, like, if they have a, well, like, I was told that if they have a passport or a green card, they really don't need to have a real ID because those no, things. Not by passport, not by passport, because you have to take your passport to get a real ID and we all need to get them by next year. Well, that's what I was told by someone at Acentria mm. when I was trying to get, um, trying to see how he how one of the boys could get a real ID she said 
he has his um, green card that could be also used or a passport. So, so yeah, uh, as, as part of your ID to go to get a real ID. So um, I know that I, I just renewed my license and I made sure to get a real ID uh, with that. And so you uh, can get a real ID compliant driver's license or identification card. So mm -hmm. I was just talking with someone yesterday and he wanted to get a real ID, but he was going to be, um, he already passed his permit test and he will be getting a license. And I said, no, you don't need both the real ID just as an identification card and your license. So hold off, save $25. No, no, I need it. Um, okay, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Because I, I had to get my, so my driver's license is a real ID. Only not all of them. You have to make sure that it no, is. No, I had to make sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I carry my passport because I do not have a real ID driver's license. And so I carry my passport, but I think there is a date when the passport will not be accepted yeah. instead I of the real ID. Next, it was supposed to be this year and they moved it to next year because of COVID, okay. I think. May 2023. Mm. Okay. So all the all our new licensees should be getting a real ID, a yeah. real driver's license, so they don't have to go through any of this stuff again. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. You have to have a lot of identification. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I don't know how they'll do that. They don't have birth certificates, but they do have right. the I-94 or whatever it is in the mm -hmm. if yeah. I could um throw out the issue that I'm having with, um, and this is more of a language issue uh, for with the, uh, the guy, um, Megan, I was texting you about mm -hmm. him. Um, the issue is he can't, apparently he can't read in his native language either. Mm -hmm. So it's like a double, kind of a double problem because he can't read English. He can't read his native language. So he can't really use the translation like mm -hmm. tools that the other guys in the apartment are using. Um, yeah. so, and so even if he memorizes like all 300 questions that could be on the learner's permit test, mm -hmm. if he can't read them on the test, you know, mm -hmm. it's not gonna do him any good. So I'm kind of stumped um, as to how mm -hmm. to help him, except for him to keep plugging away at English classes but there's um, got to be some disability type programs for the rmv because there are people who can't read you know they right. they graduate high school in the states and can't oh. read so how do they get it yeah so it could be that he just has an interpreter in posh to say the question and then he selects the correct answer i'll help you investigate that because i think that's something that we'll run into a lot so yes. yeah let's well, yeah, we'll figure that out because that um, that is really challenging. Well, and I had the thought too, like, because um, I actually had the thought. I was like, oh, because so, um, you know, there's there one of the guys in his apartment speaks um, like three languages: Pashto, Urdu, and Farsi. Mm -hmm. um, and now he's getting a pretty good grip on English. So I was like, can you like translate? Can you translate? in real time, but his English isn't good enough yet. And because there's a time thing, right? There's only one minute per question, um, oh. I mean, average out. So, right, isn't that right? It's like 25. Yeah, yeah it is time. Good, yeah. yeah, before like, what they would do, if, if you flunked it twice on the computer, they would give you a written test, but I don't know if they still have that available with since COVID. Yeah. The other no. thing is that there is um, there there is a way of getting some sort of a disability status, um, but it requires a lot of documentation. One of the young Syrian men never had a chance to really go to school, and he uh, couldn't read. So we tried that route, um, but we did get very far with it. He ended up uh, taking a vacation to Phoenix, Arizona. And where because word gets around, they know how to uh, how to do these things. But there in Arizona, there were some different rules about um, taking the test, and that it it wouldn't require um, 
I don't know, anything written, I, at an oral test. And uh, so that's what he did. And then he transferred his license to study for Arizona. Yeah, it costs mm -hmm. like 120 bucks to change your state license in Massachusetts. That's how Carmen got his license. Mm -hmm. He can't read. Yep. So there are some some interesting ways. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Sorry, go. I was, go ahead. I was going to switch to another scenario. No, no, basically. no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, so so the other guy is um, the other guy who can speak the three languages. He um, has passed his learner's permit test. And so on Saturday, I'm going to go driving with him to practice for the driving test. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't want to like have him drive in Worcester for like his first time driving in America. Do you guys know, or should I reach out to Bob? Or yes. Go where to should the I nest. Not to go to the go nest. To the nest. <laughs> the nest. What's the nest? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Jennifer's neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, so we're calling. Yeah, I'm going to text you the address right now, Ryan. But it's, okay. um, I won't, I mean, yeah, but it's basically so Jen lives in a really calm neighborhood where <laughs> good places to practice stopping, turning, you know, three point turn, parallel parking, all that jazz. But it's really low stress. Okay. And, okay. Um, yeah, especially for the first time. Yeah, except except when Layla didn't understand what a stop light, a stop sign said. And I was like, no, stop. <laughs> I just yeah. make sure to not park my car on the street. <laughs> <laughs> David, David took Samuel from the Congo out driving for his very first time right out of the journey parking lot. Oh, wow. Ooh. And they Ooh. drove for 45 minutes up and down Belmont. And oh, man. Oh, they, they went nice all dairy. around Worcester, just not on the highways. And he did absolutely fine because he'd driven in Kenya before. Uh, I think my husband's pretty brave to do that. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, Ryan, if you you know talk to Bob too, just to get tips on what things to practice. Because I I did that the first day with one, one guy I was working with, and you know because I yeah I forget things. You know you know what where you parking up a hill, down a hill. How do you turn the wheel? You know the the three point turn. What you know he he has that down in terms of what things you need to make sure you cover. So. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm actually having him practice <laughs> stuff that he's interested in. So. Uh, yeah. I will uh, send Bob an email. Yeah, sure. and he's got a PowerPoint as well. He does a separate orientation if you wanted to do that, or he would just send it to you. So yeah, we don't want anyone to feel like overwhelmed. Like, uh, I mean, there's, yeah. Great. Yeah. This one. Megan, we'll move on to transportation. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So um, really quick, transportation services, a few to be aware of. Um, there is something called PT1. So this is transportation offered through MassHealth, and it's only by doctor's orders. And there are specific rules about how many appointments you're eligible for per month. Um, and you have to submit them ahead of time. It's either 24 or 48 hours. Um, and it's only medical appointments. And so if you have someone who has a lot of medical appointments and you want to kind of check this out for them, there's a phone number or an email that you can also um, see what the possibilities there would, would be, you know, so they can get that. Um, it is pretty structured, so not everyone will qualify for it, but it's always good to check on these possibilities. There's also the good old bus, and it is free until the end of this year. I don't know if they'll extend it after that, but it's at least reached the end of this year. And they, the WRTA does have a bus trainer who, if you set up an appointment, they'll actually take um, the refugee or I honestly want to do it because I do not take the bus and I don't really know what I'm doing. And they'll literally show you the ropes, show you how to do everything and even practice routes with you. And so that is an amazing tool um, for refugees to be able to use the bus because it's really intimidating without that. Um, and then Jen will talk about this here, the clothing options. Okay, yeah, so there are various uh, clothing donation sites. As you know, we just had a big clothing drive, and so um, that supplied a lot of the needs, but there were people that still didn't get everything that they needed. Um, Ansar, which is the um, Muslim-based uh, refugee and immigrant uh, support 
organization, they do have a pretty good clothes closet and it's modest clothing or cultural clothing. And so that's by appointment only. So you can direct people there. Um, and then it's just the thrift stores, you know, teaching them how to go to Savers or Salvation Army or the Goodwill. For children, there are two, two excellent opportunities. One is, um, hasn't opened up yet. Um, they hopefully this coming week, the Lincoln Street School, uh, which is on Lincoln Street, will have a closed closet for sizes 5T to adults, uh, adult small. Um, and that's more for the elementary school age children. And that will be by appointment, or they may set it up where it's just a Thursday afternoon or something like that. But that is the, um, the number to reach the principal, Michelle Gabriellian. And then there's a great kids closet at Calvary Worship Center. They opened up in, in um, I believe, September of 2021. And it's right over the line into, um, into Holden in the northern end of the city. And there are walk-ins there Fridays, 10 to 12. If that time doesn't work out, then you can uh, call them and set up an appointment. And it, uh, I took two women there just this past Friday to see what it was all about. And um, it's really important to make sure to come with the child's name and their age, basically. Um, sizes, they don't really know sizes. They just pull things up and, and they know. But, um, and that just helps the, um, the women and whoever is bringing the, the family uh, to just pick the sizes um, because they don't understand a lot of other uh, words, but if you say kainat, they know, oh, that's my son's name. This for kainat, this for Omar. Uh, they allow like two or three outfits per um, child, and they're very generous, very warm, um, lovely, lovely um, place to visit. So <laughs> at this point, we have an expert among us. Um, Tim Jagel, we um, had several conversations come up with the refugees and they keep hearing about these tax uh, credits that they can get and who can help me with taxes. And so we reached out to Tim Jagel uh, because he's got a lot of experience with this. And as he did some researching, he realized it was a lot more complicated than uh, he thought, than we thought for sure. And so we asked him to prepare some slides and, um, and just share with us what he learned and how we can um, help anyone who comes to us and says, you know, how can I get thousands of dollars because I just <laughs> flew into the country. So Tim, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tim and I, I do the in my third whatever career now I'm, I'm officially retired from what I used to do but I do this with with Vita, if you know, as volunteers and tax assistants with the Worcester Community Action Council, I kind of do that during tax season. It's basically helping anybody low income get a, a tax return filed. Um, so, but of course, I you know tying in with what my involvement here, our involvement here, and and a very relevant question for people. Just wanted to figure out if and what we could do. So. Uh, if you could flip to the next slide there. So th this is really not taxed directly, but just as, you know, we keep hearing about social security cards and, and of course it's absolutely essential for tax, but I wanted to mention this and you know this probably intuitively in it, your experience, but, but uh, yeah, I've been with one of my, one of, one of the guys I'm with there too, and, and probably many people and, you know, his phone is constantly ringing and it's, it's from friends or whatever, but he also gets, he's constantly ringing from scams too. And I mean, I just, just advise them, especially with social security cards, guard those, you know that, but tell them that, guard those numbers, guard those closely, those physical cards and the numbers, don't ever, ever, ever give the number out to, on the phone. To anybody because people will ask that and and we have on the tax the the returns i do for other people we have lots of people where identities were stolen and and um without going into details of that but it's just it's just uh a social security card is is gold for uh, uh you know people trying to steal identities so i always tell people don't physically carry them with you memorize the number or you can 
you know, maybe, you know, if you need to take a picture on your phone or something, or even though that's kind of has its risk too, but, but um, uh, don't ever, ever, ever give it out on the phone to people, you know, someone asked for it. So, and then also too, you know, a couple of the guys I work with uh, have been errors on the social security cards. One guy, his first name and last name, which name on the card were flipped and uh, they have to correct that, you know, otherwise it's gonna, it's going to be with them forever. And you know that because this carries over to every, and it, it affects like the drivers applying for the learner's permit. That's how it happened. This one guy here, he tried to apply, but his first name and last name were flipped on the social security card because they checked the records. And, and so, and it's, it's relatively easy to fix. They have to have proof of what their, what their real name is. And uh, usually one way or another, hopefully one or another, they have something, but but you go just go to the social security card and get that you know set an appointment and you can get that corrected and they'll they'll gladly do that for you so okay so let's flip to the taxes that's on the next slide and um the big question is you know should can or should a refugee file a 2021 federal tax return and because 2021 is the year they came to the US, it's gonna be a whole lot easier. The answer will clearly be yes for 2022, but 2021 is, is, is pretty, is kind of tricky. So, and I say the general, ref, the general assumption on most, there are, I'm sure there's exceptions to what I have here, but they arrived in the US uh, August to December. They've not lived in the U.S. before. They and the members of the family do have social security cards. They don't have a green card, and they probably did not work in the U.S. in 2021, um, and, and they intend on staying in the U.S. for the near future, at least for the near future, you know, and that's, that's all that's kind of relevant. You know, there may be exceptions to this, but I think probably the majority of people we deal with, this is their, this is their scenario. Uh, and if there's other scenarios and you have specific questions on that, you can reach out to me on that. But I'm assuming that this is kind of the common situation that we're dealing with here. And so, and honestly, this is a tricky question. I've, I have contacts within the IRS and, and contacts and other tax services and so on. And it's hard to get a honestly uh, a fully confident, clear answer on every on on many of these questions. I think people just even in people in the IRS, people in the government, don't fully fully know the, the all the answers on this situation. But 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 I feel pretty confident that if, situ if the situation is consistent with the above, that they would be eligible for the fourteen hundred stimulus payment, the third one that probably all of you got uh, last year, would have been March or so, April of 2021. And of course they would not have got, received that yet. And the, the guidance for anybody to receive that is to, is to file a 2021 tax return. Uh, that's true for everybody. And, and you can say, all right, well, we'll just file a tax return for them and they can get that. Well, they can get it, but the problem is, is their, their immigrant, their resident status too. Um, uh, well, one, one point too is this, this child tax credit, you may have heard, which is a lot of money. It's like for a child, if a, if a, a child is, is under five years of age, uh, they, they could get, they could have got some of it last year, but in total for the full year 2021 taxes, they would be eligible for $3,600 for a child under five years of age or $3,000 for a child between five and 17. Um, but they generally would not be eligible for that because they have to have a home in the US for six months. So those are the kind of the big money things right, you know, right there. So it comes back to the stimulus check, which I think in, I have pretty, you know, and even the IRS guys, you know, said that they, they should be eligible for that. But the issue is because they have not been in the US for at least six months. Uh, and this is true for the stimulus check, they're eligible for it. That six month requirement is not the, the, um, the, um, the requirement for the stimulus check. All you, all you have to do is to be a resident, a citizen or a resident of the US. And the question is what defines a resident 
of the US and there's general rules. General rules, number one is they have a green card that makes them automatically a resident. Well, they don't have a green card. Number two is they've been in the US for six months but they're, they're not in, in the US for six months. And the third, third provision is kind of a special provision that if they maybe have been, in, they've been in at least one month, 31 days, I think, and they intend on staying in the US and you can get an exception for that. However, that requires some additional forms, additional filing and so on. Now I do this taxes with my organization, VITA, that I'm with in the Worcester Community Action Council. But because of the complexity of this, we're not allowed to do returns exactly like I'm talking about here. So, so what do you do though to get, get these people in money? And if you can flip to the next, next slide, Megan or, who's, or Jen, who's controlling it, so. Um, you can just tell me whatever you want. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so how, what do you do? So, uh, so the first one is what I do. And unfortunately, I was hoping we could do it and have a special and have some, a team of people come in and do it, but we can't because we're under strict IRS rules. But there are various tax services in Worcester who are doing it. Although I've talked to honestly to, uh, to some of them and I'm not fully convinced they're doing it correctly, that, but that's another issue and people are taking advantage of it. But what I would recommend most, the top of the thing, there's a partner here and Jen, Jen knows them and maybe some others. There's a, a, it's called Guru Tax Services. It's on Main Street in Worcester. And, and I actually spoke to the, the head the, the head of that uh, aid organization today. It's it's a you know they're in it's a you know they they're doing it for money. You know they're you know it's a business. It's not a government agency. It's a business. But um, they've offered to do them the them at no cost. And and I asked them well, why are you getting paid by the government to do this? No, I just want to do this. I I just want to do this. And so it's an amazing amazing um, leader of the organization. And, um, and, and I asked him to, all right, can, would, you, would you be okay? And people, people have already been actually referred to him from a century, uh, he mentioned specifically. And so people are uh, refugees, Afghan refugees are already coming to him as well as other agencies. But I asked him, well, can I through warm here? Uh, refer people to you. And he said, please do. He just asked that people don't show up at the door. Refugees don't show up at the door directly. But he asked that that we make referrals and the referrals can be done through a century or, or other organizations, but but they can also come through me. He said, Tim, can you be a, a, a source? If I call him and say, hey, um, I'd like to refer the, these, these people and you can contact me with my information there. But he said, I will take your name and I'll, I, will, uh, I will act on it and do something on it. So anyway, this has been kind of a, a long process to kind of get to this point because um, as many things as we're all finding in many government things, the, the process is not clear and easy and fast, but, but I think it, at least as I was, um, at least we have a little bit of a way going forward anyway so and you you say on here tim that we can't use the hotel address so does that mean they have to have their own apartment before december no not no it's it's uh it, it no, the the that's a good question no it's 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 just their current wherever they are current it's that that part is not the end of december but they just have to have a current valid address right now or when we file their taxes and this is a refund this i know we all think of april 15th or plus or minus when we have to file but if it's a refund and this would be a refund to them technically you don't have you can file after april 15th i mean if they you know you can file it later and the, the irs will actually give you interest on that too you won't have an assessed a penalty for filing late if you getting a refund if you owe taxes you will be but if you're getting a refund, you don't get any penalty. For, for, so if worst case scenario, if they don't have an address or a legitimate address, and a PO box works too, if, but they probably don't, I don't think they have PO boxes, but but um, uh, but yeah, I don't think the hotel would, would, would work in terms of an address, yeah. Okay, so they can be, as long as by the time we file their taxes, they have a, an address right. and they will hear they arrive sometime between August and December. 
Right, yeah. If they arrived, well, and this is arrived in the US, not Worcester. If they arrived in like Virginia or wherever, that counts as arrival in the US. So, so even if they didn't come to Worcester until 2022, if they're in the US in 2021, that's good. So Jen, do we have any other refugees prior? Did, did anybody else come in prior to the Afghans? Yes, uh, there were um, uh, just a handful mm -hmm. uh, in, in the past year, in 2021, through REAC, maybe 15 people. Yeah, because then they'd all be able to apply as well. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you're right, yeah. OK. Right. Has one more. <laughs> Tim, one question. Do they need their social security card or just their social security number? Um, I, th I think they really do need their card. If, if you're coming to me with the VITA, the thing I do in WCAC, I would say we need your card. But and I, I presume um, this guru tax service, the, the fellow there, Dr. Uh, Mitra, okay. that he would, yeah, he would require it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also translators then, because you said there's a lot of other forms, not just your basic 1040 at whatever easy thing. Um, no, I think he could go, you know, you know unless they have, unless they have, but I don't think they would have, you know, assuming they're not going to have W-2s or anything like that. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, you know, there, there'd be some basic questions, you know, they're going to ask if, you know, are you married? Do you have children? And, you know, he'd need mm -hmm. that, their information too, but but you can do, we deal with the people we deal with and by the actually we get a, not, we don't have Afghans having, you know, because of this, this thing, but we have people from other, other countries or, and so on. And we, you can, most of the things you can kind of point or use a translator or whatever to, to work through. There's not, not so many, and then there's a, theirs would be generally pretty simple too. So it's, uh, yeah. I mean, a translator always helps, but it's um, usually you can kind of work through it. Jen and I, am I correct in understanding that we still have um, many people with social security numbers, but not cards? That is true. There's a lot of um, issues with social security. Yeah. Cards. Social security will at times, I know I've seen this too, you know, when people are in process of getting their card, you know, one of the guys I work with, he didn't have his physical card, but we, he went to social security and they can't print out a card, but they did print out a document and the letterhead said social security administration or something, and it showed his number on it. And that's good. That works too. So uh -uh. if they have that. Okay. Well, that leads us right to the next section. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, Tim. That was really, mm -hmm. really helpful. So um, the social security numbers, uh, most of them were generated at the US military bases, but when people came off of the bases, there was an issue with where those cards were being mailed to. They went back to the base, uh, the people weren't there, and they're, um, they've just been all of, there's been rumors of where these uh, cards have been. Um, and so mm -hmm. they, uh, because of the issue with an address, they can't just mail them to the resettlement agency. Uh, so there's been a real problem in, in finding the social security cards that have been lost in transit. Yeah. Um, at one point, the Re REACT uh, said, well, why don't we just drive down to Washington, DC, get all of the cards we need <laughs> and drive back. And that wasn't allowed. Um, so <laughs> they are addressing this issue, um, but it is true that many people still don't have their social security card. And it is, it really does hinder them because they need it for taxes, as Tim was just saying, for their driving license, for employment, um, and then for permanent status in the US. So we, um, I was hoping to get a little bit more information on this uh, from Meg, one of the caseworkers at REAC because I had someone, uh, an Afghan who went into the social security office on Friday and said, I don't have my social security number. Can I just reapply? They looked in the system. There was no record whatsoever that there was any application done. And so he's been waiting for months hmm. for his, his number. 
And so they said, well, you can just reapply. You can apply and you'll get it in, you know, 10 days or something like that. Not a long time. So what I wanted to confirm with Meg uh, is just, you know, is that if, if this is the situation for many of these people that don't have their card, why don't we just check all of them at the social security office and say, do you have any record whatsoever of this person mm -hmm. applying? And which is, which is unusual, but not, I mean, there just was an overwhelmed infrastructure, uh, but yeah. the, oftentimes there's one form that is used for, to generate both the uh, employment authorization as well as the social security number. It's the I-765 or 795, something like that. And uh, so they're often applied together. Some people get their work authorization and have no record whatsoever of their social security application being done when it's supposed to be one application. So, um, so this, this could be good news that we've learned that he's able to reapply for social security. Um, others were advised not to do that because then you run into a problem of a duplicate, you know, two applications being processed at the same time. But if after three months, there is nothing at all in the system, I think that that's plenty of time to say, you know, there must have been a, a mistake, an error, and, um, you know, let's just get this person their social security number. So we will have more information on that uh, when we, before we send out the resource guide. Mm -hmm. Of course, they won't get it to their house. I remember, it must, this still must be the same in Worcester. Every name of every person living in the house has to be on the mailbox. That's the true. mailman yeah. won't deliver. Yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because of the address. It, the name, even the, the infant's name has to be on the mailbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Open up this document. <laughs> So the employment authorization document or work permit or EAD, um, they, uh, US employers are supposed to be checking to make sure that everyone has the lawful right to be employed. And even without an EAD card, every refugee does have the right to work. There are times when an employer will just know that that's the case and they may go ahead and have someone work even without their physical copy of their EAD. Um, but, um, but it's also a good way of identifying them and even mm -hmm. children are being issued EAD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's move on. Most of them, actually those that, that actually stayed, lingered on the military basis have a, have a um, much more orderly documents because mm -hmm. they were able to apply for all of these documents and then hand them right to them while they were still on the base. And uh, so they're coming to Worcester with all of their documents, which is great. So employment, this is a big thing uh, because there are so many people that are begging me, please find me a job, find me a job. And I have not had any guidance on what to do about that. Who is doing what? So I wanna just make that clear, as clear as I know of it at this point. Um, so um, there, for single people and married couples without children, they get enrolled in a program called CRES or CRES, which is Comprehensive Refugee Employment Services. So uh, what happens is REAC or Accentria writes out a referral, sends in some information to this program, CRES, and they will help them to get um, employment. So, and these, these refugees are eligible for the RCA, which we were talking about, refugee cash assistance, which is 428 per person per month. So if you are getting cash assistance, uh, they need to know that you deserve it, that you're not working, that this is a true need. So um, in order for them to continue to get that benefit, they have to report what they are doing for employment searching and also for um, income. So the, these, rep, these um, employment counselors that work with CRES, they have to report back to the Office 
of refugees and immigrants, or I, when, um, when someone has gotten um, employed. So, and I just learned that there is this other benefit when someone is enrolled with CRESS, they can get free driving instruction. Wow. This was just this morning that I learned of this. And so right now, um, the, they have a contract with Richway Driving School. And um, they just, uh, they actually, this guy hasn't even gotten paid yet, but he knows it's coming or I will pay him directly. Um, <clears throat> so for those that are seeking employment that are singles or married couples, the employment counselor, her name is Pabitra Nupain, and she is the one to contact for all referrals for this um, group of people. So, and her number and email are there. So she works with Ecentria, but she services all both agencies. Okay, good. So now for families with dependent children, the employable adults are enrolled in a different program called ESSP, which is Employment Service Support Program. So because these families will be receiving TAFDC, any income is to be reported not to ORI, uh, which um, uh, administers all of the RCA cash, but all these employment has to be reported to the DTA because they are the ones that give the funds through uh, DTA for TAFDC. So um, they can be enrolled in TAFDC for up to 24 months. Um, so no one wants to wait that long till they get a job, but at least there is some coverage there. If someone is not um, taking their English classes and they're not doing anything to it, to look for jobs, then this is not a benefit that is just going to uh, linger forever. So the employment counselor that covers the families for dependent children, his name is Samer Salman, and he's also at Accentria, but services both agencies. Does he, is he look, helping them look for jobs? Samer is helping the married? Yes. Look for jobs. So what that means is they are also doing some employment, some job searching, but it's overwhelming. They can't do it all. Um, so that means that we really can help them find jobs. Uh, where to do that, how to do that, you know, that's another uh, situation. But here are some tips. So you want to find out who their caseworker mm -hmm. is. Um, and, and their uh, resettlement agency and notify them that you will be assisting with a job search. And then call that uh, um, employment counselor just even to make sure that a referral has been sent from the resettlement agency. They will let you know. They have um, uh, one person has access to a spreadsheet mm -hmm. for both the uh, families as well as the singles. Okay. So sometimes there's they, no one ever got a referral, and that's really important that they all get a referral. Um, and then make sure that they have their social security number. Find out if they have any other applications that have already been submitted, because sometimes people are so desperate, they might ask me. When I walk by in the hallway, they might ask Megan, they might ask Tim. And so we all might be doing the same thing and not knowing. So we want to just really make sure that they tell us, are you working with anyone else in this and um, do you have any other applications submitted? Um, if they don't already have an email, help them create one. That's essential for all jobs and communication regarding their benefits. Um, and then you can help them create a simple resume and they'll also need to um, have their cell phone memorized and that's a part of the application process. And then once they're employed, let the caseworker and the employment counselor know. So I'd like to say that all the case managers are on top of every single client, but um, you know that's just that's just not happening. So um, there are different employment opportunities: Imperial Distributors, Wegmans, uh, Walmart, Target, TJ Maxx Distribution Center, India Market, DHL, FedEx, UPS. So, and you might have some others. Uh, we are also, there's a Worcester, um, there's a, a website that was created by the Worcester Together Afghan Response Fund. 
And uh, that once that website was um, kind of publicized, one of the things was, if you're an employer and you have a job, please you know, submit that information. So there's a lot of jobs that are on a spreadsheet hidden somewhere and no one is accessing. So we are going to access that and try to put that also into the resource um, manual so that you have some um, guidance there if this is something that you end up doing. So we'll pass okay. this over to Megan for school enrollment. And I just the last slide. slide. We I promise. Time, but we're doing good. You guys are still <laughs> with us. Yes. So um so with school enrollment, this is probably very familiar to a few of you who have been working really hard with school enrollment. Um, but for those who haven't, um, here is the rundown. So if you're doing school enrollment remotely, you're not going to the school or the Parent Information Center, you first want to take pictures of necessary documents. And this is most easily done with an interpreter um, because there, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen. So first is the ID of one parent and the child's, all the children's ID cards that you're enrolling, their immunization records. If they have school transcripts, um, some of them do, some of them don't. If they do, you can send them along. And then something called a home language survey. So this is a survey they'll fill out in their native language. You don't have to worry about interpreting that. The second thing you wanna do is send the documents, the Parent Information Center through this email provided. And then you'll call the, we call it the PIC Center. It's easier to say than Parent Information Center. So you'll call the PIC Center for an interview over the phone, and then the kids are assigned to a school. So once they're assigned to a school, there'll be a date for a school orientation. Um, and at orientation, they'll find out what their bus route is, but normally the bus does not come for the first few days. So they'll need help getting to school for the first few days. Um, and then once they're at school, the school will arrange for an English proficiency test and then help them with some different English language learning uh, tools after that. So if you're doing it in person, um, note that the appointments might be a little bit long, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours. And so you'd set up this appointment at the Parent Information Center. And again, bring all the documents you need. Um, and uh, then the English proficiency test will be taken at the appointment and the children will be assigned at the appointment. Um, so once they're assigned to a school, then they'll have their school orientation and it's kind of the same thing with the, with the bus in that way. So, um, so this is kind of the rundown of how to do that. Um, either you do it remotely or in person. Um, either one is a time consuming process, but it is very needed for a lot of the families who are eager to have their kids in school and eager to um, for them to kind of be stabilized in that way, do something the same every day. So that is, oops, the last slide we have tonight. Thank you so much for making it to the end. Um, I just wanna pause for a minute to ask if anyone has any questions or anything, and I'm willing to stay on for as long as people wanna talk and have questions, so. Oh, Heather. Um, this may be obvious, but for the in-person, you besides the documents, you need to take the um, parents and the children with you. <laughs> right, I know. It's super hard like, to take an English proficiency test without the kids. <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but I just want to make sure everybody realizes that one of the parents and every child that's being registered needs to go yeah, with their documents point. and you. <laughs> yeah. That's the Head Start program is good as well, it, although it can take a long time to get into it, but for the younger ones, mm -hmm. Head Start is nice, not just the kindergarten and first grade. How, right. how do you know when the bus starts coming to your address? They will tell you. You'll get information from downtown what, if you've been the person that's been helping that family. You usually get, in, get an, e an email from downtown Oh, uh, okay. Do we talk of letting you know that the bus is set up or from one of the other workers in the pick? Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. And when you say downtown, you mean the Parent Information Center? Yeah, pick, yeah. <laughs> pick. Um, and also, um, at the school orientation, you also have to take a parent there. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, good to know. I didn't know. Yeah. That. And, and uh, I did that, I uh, did a, an orientation and I was glad that the student was ready to stay that day. So he, we ended up uh, going in the morning and um, there was a student uh, classmate that came down and said, do you want to go to school? And so we just follow them off. And mm -hmm. um, so they, they can start on that day. Does anyone else have any other questions or things that they're learning or even things they're troubleshooting right now? And feel free if you need to hop off and continue your evening to do so, but. This, this was great. I wish I had all this information before I started. I know. <laughs> I started we. 